So thank you, um, organizers, for inviting me. Um, I'm really excited to talk about these these ideas um, on on tissue mechanics. Um, so especially, I'm going to talk about rigidity of epithelial tissues as as a learning problem. Um, but maybe a more um, general kind of question that I want to put um, in 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 during my talk, I'm going to just bring up this this idea that can be used the framework of physical learning to, to study processes in epithelial tissues. And, and, and for that, I'm just gonna talk about what I mean um, by learning. So um, we know we we're living in the era of AI. I'm sure many of you have been using ChatGPT um, in, in your research or in your life. Um, and that's um, what I mean by learning in, in the sense of these artificial neural network systems um, that we can solve these inverse input-output relation problems. Um, um, and in, in, in biological systems, I'm, I'm thinking of input-output relations in, in basically in terms of stimuli and response relations in those systems. Um, so how can we solve this learning problem in, in artificial neural networks that's, that's, that we're using um, to, to predict um, or, or to generate things? Um, um, so for example, here I'm schematically just showing schematic of artificial um, uh, neural network that, that um, um, gets some, some images and we want to train this network to be able to predict the output. Um, for that, we just write down a learning cost function. And the learning cost function for that system is nothing but basically um, the difference from, from the predicted output to, to the actual output or true value uh, squared. And that's, that's basically the error function or, or the learning cost function within these systems. And the learning degrees of freedom um, uh, in these this neural networks are nothing but node weights. So we play with node weights and we do back propagation to go down in the learning cost function. Um, and after um, some iterations, then the network learns a task and you can predict um, this, this, this basically um, uh, image recognition task. Um, so not only um, um, uh, this, this was um, um, done in basically this, this, this idea of, of, of um, uh, learning and, and training neural network to do complex tasks, um, um, that has been done also in physical system. In, in the past few years, people studied um, learning in, and, and, and training materials um, to do complex tasks um, in physical systems. Um, here I'm just showing an example of such a task. So this is a disordered elastic network and just a hookian disordered elastic network. And this is the image, the video that I got from actually uh, actually Daniel Hexner lab at Technion. Um, and I'm citing some papers that um, and there are many more that are coming out in in this era in this this basically this area of of um, physical learning and training materials to do complex tasks. In this specific example, the task that the system is trying to um, to learn is basically this: we, we apply some input strain on some part of the network. And we want to um, get the same output strain in totally different random part of the network. Um, if we don't train the network, then these two strains are totally um, basically random. So there is no connection between these two because of the disordered disor structure of the network. But we can train these systems um, um, to, to um, get the same output or the same output strain uh, at that part. And on the right, you can see that as the system is learning this task, this red um, strain is getting closer and closer to the green one as, as the system learning to do this task. So in this physical system, in this, this um, uh, spring network, we can think of node positions of, of these springs as, as physical degrees of freedom that the physics has to take care of. And the physical cost function would be just the elastic, um, the total elastic energy of the system. And because this is a bunch of, this whole system is a bunch of springs, the elastic um, energy is basically like that. You have stiffness and then um, a, a rest length for, for every spring. And the learning degrees of freedom in connection to, to what I said about the artificial neural network in this system, the learning degrees of freedom are spring stiffnesses or spring rest length. 
So you can play with these sets of learning degrees of freedom to go down in the learning cost function. And the learning cost function for this specific task is basically um, the desired strain output that, that we want um, uh, minus the, the, the predicted value or, or um, the, the value that we get at, at every iteration. Um, so it, it's similar to artificial neural network. We, we have these two um, uh, landscapes, a physical landscape that physics is just gonna take care of and the learning landscapes that we can play with this um, learning degrees of freedom to, to implement or to train the system to do this task, um, similar to, to ANNs. Um, but you might ask that this is still on the computer. This is just an elastic network on the computer. But the interesting part of this, this um, uh, um, kind of algorithm is that you can bring it into life, into the lab, um, and make actually a physical network, a physical copy of a disordered network to do image recognition or do other AI tasks for you. Um, the same way a neural network can do those tasks. Um, this is an example of resistor networks that people actually implemented this, this idea of learning by, by tuning resistances of these edges as, as learning degrees of freedom. Um, it has been successful to predict um, basically images to, to do image recognition. Um, there are other examples of, of computing with, with these physical systems. Um, this is a nice review paper on computing with optical systems that, that has been um, looked at in, in, in the literature, as well as um, just um, um, looking at the interactions, the DNA self-assembly, and, and tuning the interactions between DNAs to actually um, design and, and perform pattern recognition for us. Um, so these are just a few um, examples of, of these ideas of learning and computing with physical systems, um, wide variety of them. Um, but I'm not interested in actually computing uh, in terms of um, looking at biology in terms of computing. Um, uh, I'm interested in, uh, can, can we use this framework to study biology, to actually understand biological systems in terms of this, this um, learning framework. Um, so here is my chat GPT biology um, that, that, that is shown the complexity of biology. Um, and I think living systems are ideal examples of learning, right? The whole, um, the main difference between living systems and, and inert or, or usual condensed matter system is that these living systems can tune their properties constantly and, and can change their interactions with neighbors or, or with the environment to do some complex task. And that's, that's the, that's the um, beautiful and complex nature of biology. Um, um, and, and because of that, they're actually ideal examples of learning um, because we don't really need to think about tuning stiffnesses. Cells are actually doing that all the time. We don't really need to think about tuning resistances. Cells and, and tissues are actually doing that all the time. Um, so I always wanted to actually quote Descartes in one of my talks. So I'm going to do it here. That um, the, Descartes told us, I think, therefore I am. And I think um, the, the, the cell version of that would be, I learn, therefore I am. These biological systems, these cells, tissues, they're constantly learning. They're constantly tuning their properties um, using, using complex active feedback loops, signaling pathways. And this is really microscopic details that we know some, but, but still unknown that um, these, these cells can tune their properties to do some, some really complex tasks that is vital for their survival. Um, so um, because, because um, these, these biological systems are, are really um, good examples of learning, um, um, we, 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 we can think of them, we, tr we can try and start um, um, looking at, at these problems in terms of, of, of this, this learning problem. Um, but we have to start from somewhere. It's 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 biology is wild west. It's, it's there are so many different problems to look at. Um, so we can um, the problem that I'm interested in and I start with is actually this 
um, confluent biological tissues. So um, this is my system. This, this is um, some examples of the system I have in mind. Um, confluent biological tissues like MDCK monolayers or fruit fly embryo or, or human bronchial tissue. This is just a snapshot of 2D snapshot of these this, um, tissues and every polygon is basically a cell in these systems. Um, so this is the, 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 the system that I'm interested in. Um, and the exact problem that I want to look at is rigidity of, of these biological tissues. So the, it has been known that these confluent biological tissues can undergo rigidity transitions. Um, here I'm showing uh, a video, actually, a food fly embryo video from Karen Kesa's group at Columbia that, that um, shows these large scale deformations of, of these, these cells, um, uh, as you can see here. Um, and it has been known that um, these this, uh, confluent biological tissues undergo uh, a solid to fluid transition. Um, and that transition seems to be important for these large scale deformations um, because tissue has to become soft. These cells has to become soft to undergo these large deformations um, uh, with, with almost zero energy cost. Um, and for that, you need to, to change the state. These this tissues has to change the state from a solid rigid like to a more fluid like state. Um, on the left, I'm just showing a plot. Um, the, the data are actually experimental data from, from these fruit fly embryos from this, this paper a few years ago. Um, and the line is, is um, separating this, this solid-like behavior from fluid-like behavior. And that line is a theoretical prediction that, that has been um, uh, um, studied using some coarse grain models of, of these tissues that I'm going to talk about in a few slides. Um, so that's that's um, the exact problem that I'm interested in. Um, but the question is, what are the parameters that can affect rigidity of, uh, of these tissues? Um, so we can think of a rigidity phase diagram uh, or a jamming-like phase diagram for tissues um, um, and with the three distinct axes. So we have fluctuations, we have density, um, and we have a third axis that is less known. Um, and, and that's the axis that I'm actually really interested in. That's the geometric incompatibility axis. Um, so we know the role of fluctuations. So um, everything inside this phase diagram is solid. Everything outside is fluid-like. Um, the role of fluctuations uh, or, or density is known from, from um, other usual condensed matter systems. If you increase fluctuations, the system becomes more fluid-like, or if you decrease density and, and the system has more freedom to move around, and that becomes more fluid-like. Um, but this, this third axis um, is, is the axis that um, still you get a rigidity transition at zero fluctuations at, fake, at a fixed density um, um, by just changing some geometric features of these tissues. Um, so here I'm schematically showing what happens in, in this, this axis. Um, to measure rigidity, we, we focus on shear modulus. So that's our measure of rigidity, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> that's our measure of, um, excuse me. <clears throat> Um, so we use shear modulus um, basically as a measure of rigidity. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, and that's um, uh, if we just plot the shear modulus versus uh, target shape index of, of these um, uh, 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 tissues, we go from a more solid-like to fluid-like behavior. And, and there is a critical um, uh, uh, basically shape index. Um, that the system changes uh, their state. And I talked about what, what this target shape index is in a few slides, but, but that's the idea that at, at a zero, zero fluctuations limit and, and fixed density, you still get this rigidity transition by just playing this geomet uh, geometric factor here. Um, so this, this, as I mentioned before, this tissue fluidization is necessary for biological functions. Um, here I'm just showing some examples of the movement that, that we can get and tissues can, can um, deform from, from developmental stages um, or, or um, crypt folding or wound healing, all these processes that, that um, and basically 
the cells has to move. Cells have to move to to basically take care of these this, um, uh, processes, and that's necessary. This fluidization necessary to to actually perform this task. Um, but the question is, which learning degrees of freedom are important for fluidization? Um, and, and to talk about which learning degrees of freedom or talk about different sets of learning degrees of freedom, the same way that we talked about mechanical systems or um, resistor networks, um, we, we need a model for these, these tissues. Um, so there are many um, uh, really great models in the literature uh, to, to study mechanics of biological tissues. Here I'm just summarizing a few of them uh, from, from phase field models or, or cellular parts models, as well as uh, these deformable particle models that, that uh, you, can, you can basically uh, model a layer of tissue as, as a bunch of deformable particles. Um, but for confluent biological tissues, these vertex Voronoi models have been really successful to explain um, both um, um, this, this experimental data that has been looked at, these rigidity transitions, um, and as well as um, uh, basically some dynamical features of, of these this systems. So that's a model that I'm gonna um, focus on to, to study learning in these systems. Um, so what are the vertex models? In, in vertex model, the elastic energy of, of this system is basically summation of the elastic energy over all these cells and has two main um, contribution. One is the area elasticity, one is the perimeter elasticity. Uh, um, and this is basically the area stiffness, the area of these polygons or the cells in the tissue um, and the target area, perimeter stiffness, perimeter and target perimeter. And this, this um, mo model is successful because it has some microscopic origins. So the area elasticity is related to 3D incompressibility of this layer of tissue. Um, and if we just expand the second term, the P squared term is just related to actomizing contractility and the linear term is related to interfacial tension. So that's um, the, the microscopic origin of, of this elastic energy that we use. Um, in to put it in context of learning, the physical degrees of freedom in, in this model then are basically just coordination, uh, coordinates of these cells, the vertex coordinates of every cell, those are the physical degrees of freedom. The same way that the nodes are in an elastic networks are the physical um, degrees of freedom. And the physical cost function would be just the, the, the elastic energy here. Um, as I mentioned, the rigid transition has been studied in these this, um, uh, tissue models. Um, um, it has been known that the rigidity of these tissues depends on a specific um, shape, uh, basically dimensionless uh, parameter known as target shape factor, which is just the ratio of target perimeter or square root of target area. Um, and if we just plot the shear modulus versus this geometric factor, we go from this solid to fluid-like state um, uh, and, and, and the picture snapshots of, of these um, tissues is shown above from this, this uh, Max Beast paper um, uh, about 10 years ago that, that looked at this rigidity transition in, in these systems. Um, but the question is, what is the nature of this 3G transition? What is the nature of this 3G transition? Because we are at zero fluctuations at a fixed density. So why we have this, this actually transition between solid-like and fluid-like states? Um, to explain that, I'm just going to briefly go through a, a couple of slides and talk about a, a simple, um, elegant argument by Maxwell that can explain rigidity of, of, of frames or rigidity of, of particle systems. Um, and I, I'm, I'm gonna argue in the end that that's actually this rigid transition is different from, from that counting argument. Um, so Maxwell um, told us that um, if you want to um, look at the stability of a frame, stability of a structure, you can just count the number of degrees of freedom and number of constraints. So in this specific example, we have four um, uh, nodes. Um, so we have eight degrees of freedom in two dimensions, and we have basically four kind of bars here, which are the constraints. If we just subtract the constraints, as well as um, subtract the, the trivial rigid body motions, um, then we get one floppy mode for this system, and that floppy or soft mode is shown in the picture as the dashed lines here. And that's because, because of that floppy mode, the system is basically soft or, or fluid-like, right? 
um, we can rigidify this system if we add another constraint. So if we just add another constraint, this actually frame a based on this counting argument is totally rigid and it doesn't have any floppy mode um, in, in this, this uh, frame. Um, but that's not the whole story actually, um, because here I'm just showing two different um, uh, frames um, with the same number of degrees of freedom and same number of constraints, but the frame on the left is actually rigid and the frame, uh, the frame on the right is floppy. Um, and the reason for that is because we, we weren't careful about where to add the second constraint here. Um, we just added the second constraint in the same uh, um, basically part of the network. And that originated, um, that basically produced this state of self-stress. The state of self-stress where um, is basically, you can think of them as redundant constraints, right? Um, because of that state of self-stress that we introduced here, um, then based on um, um, basically just looking at this picture, you can see we have this floppy mode and the system is actually floppy still. Um, so the, the complete Maxwell um, Kaladin counting argument is saying that um, number of degrees of freedom minus number of constraints give us number of zero modes or floppy modes or these soft modes minus number of states of self-stress. So that's the whole counting argument. Um, and it's very simple based on, based on just counting number of degrees of freedom and, and constraints. Um, but it's been really successful to explain jamming. So this, this idea of counting was very successful to explain jamming of particles. So jamming is where we have, when we have a bunch of particles in a box and we slowly decrease this box size. And as we decrease this box size at some point, um, we get this, this tensional cluster of, the, of this, this basically um, uh, contacts. Um, and that makes the system rigid-like, makes the system more solid-like. Um, this simple counting argument can tell us where that critical connectivity or critical coordination number is, which is twice dimensionality. If you just um, look at the counting of degrees of freedom and the constraints. So that has been successful to explain jamming, um, but that can't explain um, this rigidity transition that I mentioned in tissues, because if I just look at the number of degrees of freedom for, for these tissues, is actually we have if we have n number of cells, um, we have twice, um, um, basically twice of that number of uh, vertices in the system. Um, and then a number of degrees of freedom in 2D would be four times number of cells. Um, number of constraints that we have based on that elastic energy is just twice number of cells. We have one area constraints for each cell and one parameter constraint. Um, and that's, um, if we just look at these two, we see that there is no way that the system is, is um, rigid due to this constraint argument. Um, it's highly under constraint, but still we, we get rigid structures like this if this shape factor is small. So why, why this is happening? Um, and here I'm just showing why actually this happens in this animation, um, that I'm showing the edge tensions. So the tensions between neighboring cells, if we just look at the, what, what is the value of that tension, I'm just plotting that in red with the thickness proportional to that, that edge tension. Um, as, as we increase this shape factor, so um, I'm, I'm just plotting shear modulus versus that shape factor. Um, when the shape factor is small, the system has this large spanning cluster. Um, and as we um, get to the more um, fluid-like part of the system, um, this, this large spanning cluster vanishes and there is no spanning cluster to actually um, um, basically rigidify the network. And that's why the system becomes more fluid-like. Although we, we see some local rigid clusters, but they're not connected and they're not system span. So that's exactly what's going on with, with this um, um, rigidity transition. That's, that's the, the main reason we see this rigidity transition is due to this tension driven uh, basically effects. Um, so the, the question is, can I play with this edge tension? Since I know this is the main reason that the system is rigid, can I play with this cluster of edge tensions and play with those learning degrees of freedom to get rid of that cluster? 
and make my tissue soft, make my tissue floppy by just playing and getting rid of that 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 cluster of edge tensions. So that's that's the question. Um, and I mentioned um, that this this rigidity transition, this rigidity of these tissues depends on where the shape factor is, the the, the average value of the shape factor. Um, but uh, in a, in a recent paper from from Max B's group again, um, he showed uh, nicely that not only the the average value of this shape factor, this this shape indices is important, but also the heterogeneity is important. So how much heterogeneity you have in tissue can also affect the rigidity transition where that that rigidity transition happens. So we know that the distribution, not only the mean value, but also the fluctuations of, of these this, um, uh, shape factors are important for rigidity of tissues. Um, but the question is, I want to have the same distribution of these shape factors to not change the fluctuations, have the same distribution. Within the same distribution, can I still um, make the tissue soft? Can I still get rid of that rigid um, kind of cluster without changing this, this distribution? So that's that's the the more um, uh, uh, basically restrictive case where I just um, fix the distribution of these um, parameters. Um, so as I mentioned before, um, um, this is basically the elastic energy of, of the tissue. We have four different sets of learning degrees of freedom. We have uh, area stiffnesses, we have perimeter stiffnesses for these cells. We have these target areas and, and, and these target shape factors. These all different sets of learning degrees of freedom that I can play with and I can add them in my system and let cells to choose what value they want um, as, as they, they minimize this elastic energy. And still the physical degrees of freedom are just still the vertex coordinates. Um, so basically um, what I'm gonna do is just adding this um, learning degrees of freedom um, one at a time, a set of um, basically these, these values, for example, area stiffness within a specific distribution. So the distribution is going to be fixed um, and just let self to tune this, this area stiffnesses within that distribution. Um, and see if I can tune the rigidity of the system in this, this phase diagram here. Can I, can I change where tissue becomes soft and where it becomes rigid by just playing with, with different sets of this learning degrees of freedom? Um, and we know that not all learning degrees of freedom are actually important. For example, um, uh, this paper from Barla Hack and others show that in particle packings, um, um, there is a specific set of learning degrees of freedom that is more important and more crucial for, for that specific system. So the, the question is, what are those in, in, in these tissue models? Um, here is my only one method slide here. Um, so I'm not gonna talk about the details, um, but please feel free to ask. Um, so we do um, basically constrain energy minimization. Um, um, we constrain the distribution of, of adding those learning degrees of freedom. Here, for example, if I add um, perimeter stiffnesses as my degrees of freedom, um, I start with a normal distribution. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, I start with a normal distribution and then um, I do energy minimization on this elastic energy um, and constraining some moments of this distribution to make sure that distribution stays fixed um, during my energy minimization and basically look at the change in the rigidity transition. Um, and we do that with other sets of degrees of freedom and check which set is, is more important and, and how can we tune this rigidity. Um, as I mentioned before, it's easy to alter this rigid transition by changing the distribution of this learning degrees of freedom. That that's, that's, can be done easily. Um, but the more um, uh, restrictive task is if I just fix the distribution and just induce spatial correlations by just letting cells to tune these different values, um, then can I still change the rigidity? So that's, that's the main question here. Um, so I'm just going to show um, what we find here. Um, I, we added first stiffnesses degrees of freedom. So these, these um, area stiffnesses or perimeter stiffnesses, and we added them as basically just a fixed normal distribution. 
um, and did um, energy minimization on that elastic energy. What we find is actually even with, uh, with adding these new degrees of freedom and letting cells to choose what stiffness they want, um, although the system becomes slightly softer, right? The system slightly um, softer in, in terms of this shear modulus, but actually the rigidity transition point still does not change. So the rigidity transition point does not change if we just let cells to choose what stiffness um, um, and, and change the, the what stiffness they want and change the spatial correlation of these stiffnesses values. Um, but surprisingly, if we just add um, these shape factors that I mentioned, um, these, these target shape factors as new degrees of freedom, um, um, we, we found that we can actually tune the rigidity transition point. So we, we, we it, again, this is at a fixed distribution of these shape factors, adding these um, shape factors as degrees of freedom and do energy minimization, constrained energy minimization, we found that actually we can tune um, this rigidity transition point. Um, so in, in systems without adding this P0 um, factors, you can see this system, for example, this specific point here is rigid, but if we add these shape factors as new degrees of freedom, the spatial correlations that, that uh, cells um, basically tune themselves in um, results in this basically fluid-like state and gets rid of that, that rigid cluster. Um, this happens not only with these with um, shape factors, but we can also add these target areas, the target areas that I mentioned before, we can also add those target areas and, and, and that also have a similar effect of, of changing this rigidity transition point. Um, but the question is, um, how does this rigid transition change? Why, why do we see this effect? Um, for that, I'm just going to show two snapshots of, of tissues. Um, um, here, I'm just showing shear modulus versus um, the average shape factor here. Um, the black one is the usual scenario when we just um, and minimize the energy with respect to physical degrees of freedom. And the green one here is after adding these new shape factors, these new degrees of freedom, these shape factors. Um, and I'm plotting or, or uh, plotting these this images of tissues at the same distribution of these shape factors. So this is at the exactly same distribution of these shape factors. Um, the one on the left is without learning degrees of freedom. The one on the right is with learning degrees of freedom. And we know the one on the right is fluid-like. Um, but by just looking at these two pictures, um, it's hard to tell because we just color them based on these shape factors. Um, but we can see that that the structure and, and the correlations between these shape factors change if you uh, look closely. Um, but it's, it's uh, more important to look at the basically these edge tensions. And, and because we know the rigidity is due to these edge tensions. If you just plot the edge tensions on top of these two images, we see that that large cluster of edge tensions that was responsible for rigidity in this point has been destroyed or um, um, basically removed by, by adding these shape factors as new degrees of freedom. And that's, that's shown on the right that um, by just letting cells to tune these shape factors, um, they got rid of this large spanning cluster. And that's exactly why we see this change in the rigid transition point. Again, the distribution is exactly fixed. We just played with the spatial correlations. Um, and, and more importantly, we have a knob to, to, um, to, cha to change this rigidity transition point and how much shift we can get, we actually have a knob to tune that. And that knob is just how much fluctuations of um, this learning degrees of freedom is allowed. Because when we add this, this learning degrees of freedom, we add them at a specific distribution, at specific width of this distribution. And that is our knob to, to basically tune where this, uh, how much we can get uh, a shift in the rigidity transition point. Um, here I'm plotting the transition point, the critical and um, shape factor versus that, that standard deviation of the distribution of the shape factors that we added. 
Um, the black line is the usual scenario that has been known in the literature, especially the paper by Max B's um, group, that shows if we just add um, more fluctuations, more heterogeneity, then the system, the transition point actually increases. So that is known. Um, and the red one is um, after we added this, these shape factors as new degrees of freedom, that this rigid transition point actually is lower um, for any amount of fluctuations. But um, you can see if we just plot the distance between these two, that's the purple curve here, that's just the distance between these two curves, um, and the values are on the right, that shows that there is this non-monotonic behavior. So how much we can change the rigid transition point non-monotonically depends on, on the allowed fluctuations in the system. Um, uh, and there is a, a sweet spot or an optimum value of fluctuations that gives us the largest shift in the rigidity transition point. Um, so I'm just gonna summarize um, um, everything that I mentioned here. Um, so we, we said that these cells have ability, of course, to tune their microscopic details in our tissue models that, that translates to tuning stiffnesses or target areas or target parameters um, in our coarse grain models. And, and there is this huge space of learning degrees of freedom to study because we have all these different stiffnesses, these, these different target areas, target parameters. And because we were interested in rigidity of epithelial tissues, so the question was, what is this rigidity fluidity most sensitive to? What are the important parameters um, that we can use to tune rigidity of these tissues? And we found that actually target area and shape factors are the parameters that we can play with to get rid of this, this largest, basically rigid cluster in this system and make the tissue soft. Um, before showing acknowledgments, I'm gonna go back to my original kind of introduction. So I talked about this uh, framework of physical learning that people have been using um, to, to train and, and, and to apply learning ideas in physical systems. Um, and I think that's that might be a useful tool for biological systems because that's what biology does. That's that's exactly what, what biological systems do. Um, but of course, there are open questions um, because if we want to understand and to study this, this phenomena, in, in, in this complex system, then the question is, well, what is the learning cost function? Um, what are the, the learning degrees of freedom? And those are more specific um, to, to your system, to the system that, that you study. Um, so th those are the, the, the important question um, and, and our system is specific. Um, especially um, in, in my problem here, I focused on elastic energy both as, as physical cost function, but also as the learning cost function, because I just um, did energy minimization with respect to both physical degrees of freedom and this added learning degrees of freedom. Um, but that was a choice because I wanted to look at the rigidity of these tissues. So the question is, what is learning cost function for other properties or other um, uh, uh, complex um, systems? Uh, a more um, unique example of, of these um, tissues that I have in mind is this convergent extension phenomena in, in, in Drosophila, where this embryo goes through this, this contraction in one axis and extending in the other axis. And this is an important part of development of this, this uh, fruit fly embryo. Um, can we understand this in terms of learning? Can we put this problem in terms of this framework? Um, if, if we can, then what is the learning cost function? And, and, and if, if we can do that, um, does, um, can we um, study this? Can we get this kind of deformation by just playing with shape factors or just playing with stiffnesses? Those are, those are the open questions that I think are, are interesting. Um, with that, I'm just gonna um, thank um, uh, my advisors, Lisa Manning at Syracuse University, Andrea Liu at, at UPenn, and, and our collaborator, um, Indrajit Ta, who's been really fun to, to work with on this project. And I'd be happy to take um, more questions. Thanks.